Hey kids, John here. I had an incredible opportunity today to sit down with Javier Gonzalez, one of the young lead players here in Los Angeles, California, and have a, a discussion about playing trumpet, about working in Los Angeles, and some of the things that he did to develop his playing overall and develop his upper register. And there is a three-part series of this interview that I am posting on the channel. This would be the very first part of the video. Hey kids, we're here with Javier Gonzalez. He's a very fine commercial lead player and all-around versatile, amazing trumpet player in the Los Angeles area. Has a host of credits to his name already. And we're just going to have a, a bit of a conversation with him and he's going to give us some very interesting information about trumpet playing and, and possibly how to get into the industry. And let us start there. How did you become a Los Angeles-based commercial trumpet player? Well, being a, a native Los Angeles person, uh, it was as difficult as being a person from out of, out of the state, <laughs> to be honest. So there was no... So there, <laughs> let me get in closer here. Let me make sure everybody understands that. So there was no local boy here? There was here. no local boy at all whatsoever. Because the, the biggest thing about Los Angeles is being one of the biggest capitals of music industry for recording stuff for decades everybody wanted to be here so in the last 20 even 30 years there was this massive wave of incredible musicians trying to get into the industry here so somebody like myself and others who are local who are born and raised in california you have to make sure you're equal in, in skill wise to be able to get in there or at least to get recognized what are the basic, I'm just going to have you just do large block type skills that you really have to have down. What are those basic things that you need to be in that scene? Well, one, the biggest one is you have to be able to know your, your, your instrument. You have to know your instrument. Uh, and by that, I mean you have to be able to be competent on there doing your flexibilities throughout the whole range of the instrument, articulation in many styles. And most importantly is reading music. That's the biggest key, reading music and then owning it like it's yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the things I find interesting, and, and I've talked to other LA lead players and, and musicians, and that is the whole uh, concept of intonation and, and having that together. Mm -hmm. Is that truly a huge important part in, the, in, this, in this puzzle? Yes, because uh, when, when you have good intonation, when you're in a section, it's going to sound better. It's going to be a fuller sound, and you get a lot a louder sound with that actually playing louder. Okay. So, uh, cutting to the chase, let's get to the the lead player range type of uh, questions. I I I just and as I've said to you, and I'm going to say it on camera here. I certainly admire your tenacity and your and your drive and your dedication to this instrument. So, how did you go about discovering range? Well, actually, when I started playing the trumpet, I started because I saw some insane trumpet player on PBS playing Carnival of Venice. That's how I started my obsession with the instrument. I mean, obsession with the instrument. Because I mean, if you don't, if you can't, if you don't like this instrument, you're not gonna be a good musician. You know, you have to really enjoy this difficult machine. So. It started from being obsessed with just learning technique and just learning the sound, just learning how to master something that seems sometimes you can't master it, you know. So when I started discovering range was around eighth, ninth grade. Uh, the teacher in that middle school brought and started making the big band. So we started bringing all these charts that, at my, for me, playing a high A or B was really, really hard. Which you know, for a middle school kid, usually that's the case, <laughs> you know. So he was bringing in his great big band chart, and I started figuring out, like, I'm working way too hard. Even as a young kid, I realized this shouldn't be this difficult. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was using the wrong equipment. <laughs> I, had too much, I had a cornet. It was too much of a big mouthpiece. And you, you can't sound like a recording of a great lead player on the cornet. <laughs> so I was learning how to play high notes, or well, high notes, in middle school on that. So I had to figure out how to make it sound better. And through that, I just figured that airspeed was a key. I don't know what exactly it was, but I knew I had to blow more air into the instrument without hurting myself. Yeah, interesting. So when you started to really refine this, what are some of the exercises that you discovered that helped you figure out how to deal with airspeed and that whole concept of, of 
air and using your air to support the vibrations of those mm -hmm. upper register nodes. Well, it first started with just the clock book doing chromatics. Doing chromatics and trying to do it, as he says, you know, 12 times or as much as possible in one breath. Mm -hmm. So I started learning that, of course, not with great speed, but eventually it got better. But I just started noticing that when you start incorporating an octave or more in chromatics, tongue placement is a key factor, especially when you're going to the higher range. Uh, when your tongue is in a higher position, you're creating a smaller gap inside your mouth, so more air comes out through that small gap. Which, at first, I don't know how to figure that out, but I just realized that something was happening when in chromatics, the high notes were easier, and tonguing or articulating phrases, it was difficult. And then one day, years later, it clicked that tongue placement has to do a huge part in high range. Okay, so when you are discussing tongue placement, how do you describe what you're doing? How, how do you help people understand that concept? Well, the best way for those of us who can whistle or do a whistle sound, uh, when you're whistling, the thing that's changing the pitch is your tongue placement. When you whistle, you have your lips, and when you go up a pitch, my lips aren't really moving. The tongue is changing the airspeed, which there changes the, air, the, the sound, the pitch. So pay attention to what your tongue is doing in that situation, yeah. and then apply that to playing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you give me? Um, is there a demonstration of that type of thing on the horn that you can that you can do, and then after you play it, explain what you just did? Yes. A technique that I've been working on that maybe was it is definitely not my original technique. I actually learned it from the Bill Adams guys mm -hmm. uh, who do the lead pipe buzzing, okay. where, you, where you hit a pitch. <laughs> And with Bill Adams, it's just to get the, the, the air speed going, your tongue position, you want to put air into the horn. And one of the stick things was doing this. I, in my undergrad, started doing a more complex version of it, where I started incorporating major arpeggios, ascending and descending, and major scales. So the way I figured out is doing major arpeggios on just the lead pipe. So let's get a, a center pitch first. I'm starting on uh, E flat concert or F. So I'm going to do an F major arpeggio just on the pipe. And now I'm going to do a scale. So, uh, I know actually how oddly difficult that actually is. There's a lot that goes into what you just demonstrated so very easily. <laughs> yes. Um, so when you're controlling that, okay, wh was that the process that helped you really start to understand your whole tongue position thing? Well, what started was uh, saying the chromatics, and the chromatics, when you're going... <laughs> When you're going up, your tongue is going up mm -hmm. to compensate for the air going up and make the high notes easier. And when you're coming down, you have to open it up, back, get back to the low range. Right. And I figured that, you know what, in the lead pipe, you can also achieve the same thing with less effort. Actually, scratch that, with more effort. But if you learn how to do it with less effort, you're doing a huge process with, with little effort, to mm. be honest. It, it is difficult at first. But the airflow, which does this, the tongue is doing the same thing I do with the trump, with the whole trumpet assembled, chromatically, just lifting the air up and letting the tongue control the pitch. Interesting. Is there anything happening with your chops at the same time? I mean, what are you, what are you thinking about with? So you've got your, your tongue working, mm -hmm. how do you deal with what you're thinking about with your embouchure, or your aperture, or any of that? Well, I started doing the Claude Gordon routine years ago mm -hmm. uh, through my former teacher, Bill Bean, who was an incredible teacher. He really pushed me to be better. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he, I, I started doing the systematic approach to daily routine, Claude Gordon. Mm -hmm. And that whole exercise, which is a 52 week study of just, you know, long notes and high notes and low notes, but 
his thing, big thing is you always go low and high, but you come back down to the center where you started from. Right. So my thought process was that I always want to achieve playing high notes, but still come back to the low notes, or play low notes to go back to the high notes. Okay. Because uh, that's a big part of the instrument. A lot of people, you know, change equipment to do that for high notes or low notes. Right. I kind of wanted just to have one setup, and so far I've been successful with it. So with your chops, you're not really thinking so much about what's happening, whatever, with your lips or your corners. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just something that you probably... Well... Tell me about that. Okay, so on the lead pipe, it's very difficult at first to make an actual sound. When I first started, I wasn't getting a full sound. That's a full sound. When I first started, maybe the, the first pitch I played sounded great, but when I would move, say, a third... Mm. Right now, it sounds fine because I know how to approach it, but when I first started, I probably didn't make this. Right there, my lips are not really being used. Okay. They're just holding the pitch, and go. then the tongue's going up, and then it goes all over the place. And it, it doesn't sound very good. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I go up there, I'm actually slightly bending up like when you when you bend down the trumpet when you play the this exercise it's that approach mm. but just in a more extreme way interesting mm. so what you've done is you've you you've really honed in on being able to produce each pitch in different ways, both on the lead pipe, no valves, bending notes. Mm -hmm. So you've got a really, really acute control over the full range of the trumpet in, yeah. in that manner. Yeah. So, um, well, before you go there, I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, it's 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 a, a routine that I sort of had been messing around with to sure. to get goals that I was trying to achieve. You know, and so it, it may not work for everybody because everybody has different approach to everything. That's why we have so many different uh, methods out there that are all very, very good methods. You know, but something like uh, a method that's mainly geared towards a classical player, uh, which is the, for me was the, the Buzzing Basics, great method. Mm -hmm. I used it a lot, uh, but it, it, it wasn't allowing me to do what I needed to do mainly the high range, mm -hmm. uh, but buzzing in the mouthpiece wasn't working for me in the high range because it just didn't feel the same on the instrument. Mm -hmm. For me, the closest thing was incorporating the lead pipe with the buzz, a buzzing method. Okay. And that up there, which is a whole different way of, bl of blowing into the instrument, allowed me to get or at least achieve some sort of perfection in one area of getting the high range incorporated with the low range. Interesting. I just want those viewing this to kind of get a sense of your capabilities in the upper register <laughs> Having done this, so when you're when you're working on things in this in the extreme upper register, you and I actually had talked about this a little bit. Uh, when you first encountered above, you know, G above high C, mm -hmm. and that register uh, just above that, did you have a, a break or a problem note or something that was an issue? Before I started doing the lead pipe stuff, there was lots of breaks. Okay, I had a break on E. I had a great break on F sharp. For some reason, F sharp was just difficult for me, and anything above G was there was no aim whatsoever. I couldn't land on it. I, I was all guessing. <laughs> wow, okay. Yeah. And so the lead pipe stuff really gave you a greater control of everything that was just basically happening in your face. Mm -hmm. And then uh, also, obviously, there's an air component to the lead pipe thing. Mm -hmm. When you went from the lead pipe, then started you know moving into the upper register on the horn, what kind of things were you working on that really helped you take what you'd grasped on the, on the lead pipe and put them into that register? Well, what I did was actually the, the, the method, the major arpeggios and scales that I was using on the trumpet with the lead pipe by itself, mm. I would then start doing that with the whole setup to, to have some familiarity with uh, the lead pipe and then the whole trumpet assembled. This concludes part one of the three-part series with Javier Gonzalez. And uh, take a look at part two. There's a lot of great information there.